the end of a story, and the start of another. After returning all of the children to safety, losing the King of Hyrule to the depths of the vast sea, and ultimately defeating Ganondorf once and for all, Tetra and Link set off into the unknown, on a journey to find new lands and new Hyrule. But what was to come next? What adventures lie in the future for our two heroes? Phantom Hourglass was one of the many direct sequels we've gotten in the Zelda franchise, taking place a few months after the events of The Wind Waker. There is a catch though, this direct sequel wasn't released on the GameCube, nor was it released on the Wii. It met the terrible fate of hitting the Nintendo DS, a handheld console so underpowered it wasn't even capable of handling a 3D game, or so everyone thought. As a matter of fact, this game wasn't even planned to come to the DS. Let's start from the beginning, shall we? The Wind Waker 2, which was the working title of this game, started its planning phase all the way back in some time during the Wind Waker's development. Nintendo had a crazy sequel planned where Link and Tetra ended up in this strange new world, away from the Great Sea and onto the vast uncharted lands. It would still have these cartoony cel shaded graphics, but the game would have a darker tone, featuring refined horse riding mechanics as promised all the way back in Ocarina of Time, and an adult version of, um, um, let's, uh, Actually, I, I don't even want to talk about that part. <laughs> That's uh, uh, pretty cursed, I would say. Right, right, right. Uh, what was I talking about again? Okay, I was talking about the sequel to The Wind Waker? I, saw you, I hope you mean um, the cancelled remake from Ubisoft that was only created by two guys and was never officially pitched, right? Wait, what? Wait, wait we're not supposed to talk about that? Oh, oh, shh. Okay, okay. Shush, shush, shush. Okay, just, uh, let's, uh, let's not mention that to the audience. Um, if I dive too deep in this, I might just cancel this whole review, just like how many of these damn prototypes of sequels all got freaking cancelled. But hey, here we are now with technically the One Waker 2, Phantom Hourglass. Yay. The gameplay here adopts a mix of traditional top-town Zelda games with a bit more freedom of movement beyond the typical eight directions you walk in with a D-pad. The types of attacks you do also take some inspiration from a third-person Zelda game with stuff like jump attack being implemented in a top-down perspective. Uh, pretty cool I would actually say because it's not really something that's been necessarily done properly in the past games. It's always been like a weird jump and a sword slashing down but it's not really like... In a sense, it's like a third-person Zelda game put into a top-down perspective. But uh, there is a catch, and I, um, I this was the thing I was the most scared to bring up because I know you and many other players despise these games because of this. Almost every action in this game is done solely with the use of the touchscreen. You move using the touchscreen. Attack, touchscreen. Items, you use the touchscreen. You want to check your map and start drawing all over it? Obviously, you have to use the touchscreen. How about talking to people? That's pretty easy, right? No, just tap on them with the touchscreen. Touchscreen, touchscreen, touchscreen. For a handheld console that has a D-pad, four face buttons, and two shoulder buttons, there could have been at least some kind of button controls. I mean, just look at Super Mario 64 on the DS. That thing had both touchscreen controls and button controls. Why couldn't they just do the same here? Like, it wouldn't have been perfect, but like, it certainly would have been nice to have it as an option. And this is not even considering ergonomics, as both the DS and especially the DS Lite don't really feel too comfortable, especially when you're playing this game. I, like, I had trouble trying to hold my DS and uh, the stylus and, you know, kind of wiggle it between my fingers at the same time. It's so tough to balance it, and like, it starts cramping on your hands. Nitpicks aside, I completely forgot to talk about the other segment of the game, traveling. 
This game tried to take an updated approach to traveling with steam-powered ships as opposed to the sails from the Wind Waker. And rather than having to travel in real time, you would draw out your, uh, your route, basically, and your ship would go that way. Ideally, this saves a lot of time and allows for you to actually enjoy the environments around you. And this actually makes fighting enemies a lot less tedious and we're always prepared. There is one problem, though. There's really not that much to explore. You have preset islands to land on, but there isn't really that many places to go around the map. And there also isn't that many new islands to discover on this map that you've already been given on the big ocean maps. So on paper, this really seems like a brilliant idea, but the execution just didn't seem that good with the limited number of places. On the bright side, this is played in a third person perspective, so you aren't entirely stuck into a narrow top-down view of the world. And it makes you wonder, what would this game be like on a full-blown console? And speaking of which, uh, let's throw out the mechanical twists, and you have yourself, well, a regular Zelda game. Dungeon, mini-boss, items, boss, the only difference is that some dungeons make up the use of a DS microphone or the in-game app, but otherwise the dungeon puzzles remain generally the same, obviously more catered to the variety that the DS uh, has with its touchscreen. There is one exception to this. I honestly never found the reason why people hated this because, to be honest, like most games kind of adopted this structure anyways, but here's the thing. For its innovative design and implementation of stealth, and elements taken from the roguelike genre, I bring to you the Temple of the Ocean King, the only full-scale Zelda dungeon to require you to revisit the same locations over and over and over again. The way that this dungeon is structured is unlike any previous dungeon I've ever played. One of the biggest factors is obviously the stealth, and another interesting part is the uh, roguelike, oh I might probably say roguelite elements in this, as the intention is meant to replay this over and over again, technically speaking. Obviously, with the TS's limitations, you can't really have true stealth elements. So what they did to sort of fix this um, was add purple areas on the, around the dungeon that you can stand in, and uh, these enemies won't be able to see you, and this uh, strange magical force wouldn't kill you. Wait a minute. Magical force? Right, yeah, I forgot to tell you, uh, this dungeon also has a bit of a time limit too. Phantom Hourglass. It's the item in the game that's right on the title, and, well, you get to use this as your clock. And this clock protects you from harmful magic found within the temple, if you're traversing anywhere outside the purple areas. It pretty much, if you run out of time, the temple slowly kills you. In terms of how each location is laid out, I will say that they're all pretty memorable, or at least simple enough that you aren't running around in circles finding where the heck you should go. Actually, I would go to the say that these islands are actually more memorable than the Wind Waker. There's just a whole lot more life and personality to each of these islands, and most of these islands aren't just the teeny tiny islands you hop off your boat and just spend like 30 seconds on. We're talking about how each island kind of has its own identity. I'll get straight to the point with this next segment. Phantom Hourglass as a DS game looks amazing. As a Zelda game though, it looks like garbage. How can you expect someone to go from this to this? The DS was limited by hardware, yeah, but keep in mind, this was originally planned to be a GameCube game. We're only stuck on the DS because of the backlash that the Wind Waker got. However, the animations in this game are generally faithful, in comparison to the polygonal textures we got in this game, really not much I can say other than cutscenes genuinely feeling like cutscenes. This was the game on much more powerful hardware, whether it be a Wii or even a 3DS for that matter. I would like to think that the cutscenes would have the same animations, but way, way, way better textures. Just think of how a potential remaster or even a remake would look. Unfortunately, that's Pretty much where the good things end. Uh, this game has probably one of the most lackluster soundtracks in all of Zelda history. Out of the entire soundtrack, you'll be stuck to hearing maybe like five of the themes for the majority of the game. Like five of the same themes, over and over again. There are a lot of dungeons in this game, yes, but um, they also share like one theme exclusively. Like that's even less than the amount of dungeon themes in the first Zelda game. And this one loops so quickly that I don't even know if you could consider it to be a theme. 
In other words, every dungeon kind of feels the same. Like, I take back what I said before about the Temple of the Ocean King. If the music stays the same, then all the dungeons kind of feel the same. All it does is make you, you know, kind of tells you that you're in a, a so-called bad guy place in the most generic way possible. Topped off with gloomy fog and the sounds of monsters all over the place. They tried to design each dungeon with a different theme, but like with your typical Zelda game, everyone shares the same song. The same freaking looped song that lacks even more originality than the original dungeon themes from the first Zelda game. One theme you'll hear regularly is one that you should be hearing, however. It's the travel theme, which also is used for the title sequence. Obviously, they're trying to give out the vibes from the Wind Waker while being its own thing, so I'll applaud them for having some level of consistency there. Alright, 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 fine. This soundtrack is not uh, completely lackluster. Linebeck's theme is probably one of the only few that have real personality. It's like they spent all this time working on his theme specifically and forgot to do the rest of the game. His theme was composed to emphasize his self-centered, pretentious personality of being a brave captain who has faced all the worst enemies and every single worst sailor's nightmares, meant to hide his cowardly and greedy intentions from within. In a way, he kind of reminds you of Jack Sparrow from Pirates of the Caribbean. A lot of the best music is heard at the very specific situation. I think it's safe to say that the majority of this game's soundtrack was spent on the finale. I certainly can't blame them for being limited by the DS's hardware limitations, but it could have been more diverse and um, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of other DS games with much larger soundtracks out there. Moving on to the story, because Phantom Hourglass was one of my first two Zelda games, other than being Twilight Princess of course, I had zero clue what kind of established lore there was, other than that I'm simply playing Link and Tetra's just Zelda and Ganondorf was previously defeated. As a direct sequel, Phantom Hourglass did not spoil much of The Wind Waker for me, despite having about six years apart from me finally being able to play The Wind Waker for the first time. That was six years of me playing the sequel before I got to play the first game. I had a GameCube, but I wasn't really into Zelda games at the time, nor did I really know of their existence. Long story short, the Phantom Hourglass starts you off with Link and Tetra continuing with their journey a few months after the Wind Waker. The crew starts talking about the rumored ghost ship, and almost on cue, the ghost ship appears. Tetra and Link try to raid it, but Link falls into the water, blah blah blah, while Tetra gets kidnapped, just like Zelda. Link wakes up on another journey to help an elderly man, a uh, fairy, and Linebeck, the cowardly greedy captain that I mentioned earlier who only decides to help Link because of the interest of treasure. They go uncover secrets of the ghost ship location where Tetra is presumably held hostage, and halfway through the game they save Tetra, but then she's turned to stone and they continue the journey to free her. Four more dungeons later, later and she's been free, free, but instantly kidnapped by the game's main antagonist, Bellum. One of the final blah 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 blah. There is just a lot of filler in this story and not really too much uh, real development, I'd say. Phantom Hourglass did quite a good job being an independent game from The Wind Waker rather than just being, you know, a simple sequel, but I find it being a big weakness, as I mentioned earlier, with the story being really filler as a point. What makes Phantom Hourglass's story good is that the fact that the game went pretty quickly in establishing that Link is in a brand new world. Already that's something that avoids alienating new players like myself. The game did not take long to introduce or establish themselves and the characters were instantly recognizable for some odd reason. Uh, in a way, it kind of mimics Majora's Mask and how it set its own story, uh, even though it was a direct sequel, but then it became its own thing. However, it does become a downfall because this is a sequel and there are a lot of expectations. And when you get a sequel that ends up being some stupid side quest or something that's not even completely related to the whole overarching story, it can get pretty disappointing for many players. This whole game kind of just turned out to be some kind of filler episode in the series or side quest. Not really anything substantial towards character development, like it was just kind of there, like, you could kind of just skip this game, you know, like, you don't really hear about the story, it's just kind of barely expanding upon the world of the Wind Waker, almost as if it was trying to be filler for a certain third game in a franchise, hmm? Hmm? 
please don't make me do this part of the review. Please don't make me do it. Fine. This is the third ever multiplayer Zelda game to ever exist, as far as I can remember. It's also the worst. I'm not even going to hesitate to say that. It's bad. It's really, really bad. I'd rather lock myself in a room and run a marathon, replaying all three CDI games over and over again. The objective to the multiplayer is to score the highest amount of points while you're playing as Link by tossing these Triforce pieces into special designated zones that correspond to your player's color. Uh, kind of like capture the flag in a sense, but in a much smaller scale. The Triforce pieces are slightly heavy, so you have to have good knowledge of the movement in order to safely move. But obviously because there's this multiplayer, you do have an opponent to watch out for. This opponent plays as three phantoms, and they must prevent Link from scoring these points by simply moving to attack them. There are also various traps scattered across the map and various power-ups that each team can use to their advantage. It's basically just a multiplayer version of the Temple of the Ocean King. In theory, this concept sounds actually very fun. It makes for some very competitive gameplay and truly puts players to the test to see how well they can actually play with Phantom Hourglass's mechanics. But there is one fatal flaw that absolutely ruins this game mode. Movement. As Link, movement is normal, just like single player. As the Phantoms, you are essentially praying half the time and drawing on a map. To move the Phantoms, you have to draw a line on the map just to get a fixed path for them to walk on. It's like trying to telegraph where the opponent's going, but you have to do it in real time. By the time that happens, you've already lost! The Phantoms can automatically attack, but they're moving slow as hell. How in the world can you successfully control three Phantoms strategically? Why are you forced to play a tactical RPG in real time while the other player gets to freely roam like it's an action-adventure game? It doesn't make any sense. What were they thinking? As a direct sequel to one of the best Zelda games ever made, <sighs> Phantom Hourglass manages to hold up on its own with a few bruises here and there. Um, it's not the most impressive game ever made, but for the time, I'd say it's one of the most ambitious Zelda games ever made. I think uh, it's something I'm a little biased about, and had it not been for growing up with it, it's safe to say that this game is actually pretty bad. It's a D tier. It's nostalgic, but man, there are so many flaws with this game. Like, I do applaud it for trying to uh, trying to experiment with the roguelike genre and stealth and you know whatnot, but this is a this is a really crappy filler episode. Let me get you let me get that straight.